Hi, and welcome to chapter 15. In this video, we're going to be looking at genes and proteins, more specifically how we get from DNA to messenger RNA, and then from messenger RNA to proteins. So the process of gene expression, going from DNA to messenger RNA, and then messenger RNA to proteins, is also known as the central dogma of molecular biology. DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, so that process is known as transcription. And then messenger RNA is read and translated into proteins. So we have transcription and then translation occurs. How do we transcribe DNA into messenger RNA? We're going to see that the main enzyme that completes this process is known as RNA polymerase. And that makes sense because remember from the previous chapter when we were copying DNA, that was performed by DNA polymerases. Now we're making messenger RNA, so we're using RNA polymerase. Remember that DNA and mRNA differ in that in RNA we have uracil instead of thymine. Also, we're going to see that in messenger RNA, mRNA was, is going to be single-stranded compared to our DNA. So only one of the two strands of DNA will be transcribed into messenger RNA. Once we have our messenger RNA, it's going to be translated into proteins, primarily through the function of ribosomes. Remember that there are about 20 amino acids in nature, and depending on the type of amino acids, that are in your protein that will affect the three-dimensional shape and the function of that protein. We saw this chart way back for exam one material, but these are some of the amino acids that we have in nature, and they affect the three-dimensional folding of proteins because of the side chain or R group that is shaded in blue for each of these amino acids. Remember that some of these were water-loving, they could be charged, uh, positively charged, negatively charged, some of them were non-polar or water fearing and that could mean that they're folded on the inside of some kind of globular protein away from the watery environment or aqueous environment. So the type of amino acids that we have in our proteins we're going to see are determined by the nucleotide sequences in our messenger RNA which are determined by the nucleotide sequences in our DNA. So that central dogma of molecular biology where the flow of genetic information in cells goes from DNA to messenger RNA and then messenger RNA to protein is kind of summarized here in the picture to the right. Here I have my double-stranded anti-parallel DNA molecule. Remember, anti-parallel means one strand runs from five to three and the other strand is anti-parallel running from three to five. Only one of the strands of DNA will be transcribed into messenger RNA and it looks like for this one, it's the bottom strand. Here I have my single-stranded RNA, and as I mentioned earlier, we see uracils instead of thymines that we see in DNA. That is completed by RNA polymerase, that main transcription process. We'll see that in eukaryotes, our RNA molecule actually has to be processed before we get our final messenger RNA. And then ribosomes will come into play where they're going to read our messenger RNA and translate that into some kind of polypeptide sequence forming our protein. Here's another look at that flow of genetic information or the central dogma. I have my double-stranded DNA molecule. I'm going to transcribe that using RNA polymerase to our single-stranded messenger RNA that contains uracils instead of thymines. And it looks like this is the template strand that RNA polymerase used to make the mRNA. So what it's going to do is it's going to read thymine, and I know A pairs with T, so it puts down an A, except remember that this is going to be an RNA nucleotide, so the sugar will be ribose instead of deoxyribose. When it reads an A, I know A pairs with T, but in RNA, there's no thymines. We instead have uracils, so we put that down. RNA polymerase reads C and puts down G, and so forth. So every nucleotide on the template strand, this being the template, will be read by RNA polymerase, and they will put down the complementary RNA nucleotide. After that, ribosomes will translate the messenger RNA sequence to produce a polypeptide sequence. 
And it's going to be pretty neat because every three, let me erase this red stuff so I have more space to write. Every three RNA nucleotides is going to be called something known as a codon. And every codon is going to be equal to one type of amino acid. In this case, AUG codes for the amino acid methionine. And then the ribosome goes down to the next three, the next codon, and that encodes some kind of amino acid and so forth. So each of these codons is composed of three nucleotides, and that ultimately encodes some kind of amino acid. Once I have all my amino acids linked together through peptide bonds, that creates my polypeptide, which is going to fold into some kind of protein shape. And that gives me my phenotype, what I see, what you actually see, the physical traits. As I mentioned earlier, the three nucleotides in my messenger RNA is known as a codon, and that encodes a specific amino acid. The reading frame is very important when translating messenger RNA RNA into proteins because it tells me which nucleotide I should start the first codon with. Here I have my reading frame. It looks like it's every three nucleotides that generates each of these four amino acids. If I had some kind of mutation where extra nucleotides were inserted or even deleted, that would change my reading frame and result in a non-functional protein because I would no longer have the correct amino acids laid down. So for instance, if I accidentally deleted this C, then this G would no longer be there, and my reading frame would be shifted. So my first codon would be AUC, and then GGU, etc. And most likely the amino acids would be completely different down here and not be anything close to the functional protein that I originally had. All these amino acids would no longer make sense. This is actually a picture from the previous lecture, and I used a sentence in my previous lecture as well, or really a phrase. If you guys remember, I used the cat and dog, and we had a deletion, and with that deletion, we no longer had that, that sentence or that phrase. It no longer made sense. They're showing the same thing here, where this is the original sequence and they're going to delete these two nucleotides. As a result, everything gets shifted to the left by two nucleotides, and I no longer have the same sequence of amino acids following that deletion. So this reading frame has shifted, and this is going to result in a non-functional protein, or perhaps will terminate the protein synthesis. So what I have down here is a picture of the genetic code, which is really cool because it's degenerate. What that means is that there are more codons than amino acids. So if it's degenerate, each amino acid can be encoded by more than one codon. And I can see that as I look through the chart. For proline, this is one amino acid, there are four codons that can encode for the amino acid proline. So in this chart, we have 64 possible codons, and these encode for amino acids, the 20 different amino acids that we have. And there are also three stop codons that tell us when to stop translation. Degeneracy is important because we think it's a mechanism that the cell came up with through evolution to reduce the negative impact of random mutations. So in our DNA, if we happen to have some kind of mutation, for example, in the third nucleotide for this codon, then it's okay because all of the nucleotides that we see here, all the codons that we see here for the first two nucleotides still encode the amino acid leucine. And I see that here for threonine as well. If I happen to have some kind of mutation in that third nucleotide site of the codon, that's okay because these all still encode the amino acid threonine. So that's what degenerate means. Each amino acid is encoded by more than one codon, and it probably protects us from random mutations. Let me look at more closely, how do I read this codon chart? So let me erase some of my markings. If I want to quickly find an amino acid or which codon encodes an amino acid, 
If you look at the axes, here on the left I have my first letter. So let's say I want to look at CUG. What is CUG? Um, what's the amino acid for that codon? C, I can see the first letter is all in this row. The second letter is on this axis, C, so CU, so it would be somewhere here. And the third letter would be here, CUG. So I can see CUG encodes the amino acid leucine. So you do not have to memorize the codon chart. If it's on an exam, I would give it to you, except for four codons that I do want you to memorize. The first one is the start codon, which is AUG, and that encodes the amino acid methionine, methionine. In prokaryotes, like bacteria, you'll see that there is a formal group attached to the methionine. So you'll see that sometimes they call that FMET, or formal methionine. The start codon is important because it initiates translation and sets the reading frame. So what this means is we're going to see the start codon near the Fry prime end of the messenger RNA. And following the start codon, the messenger RNA is going to be read in groups of three nucleotides until we encounter one of the three stop codons. So the stop codons are also what I would like you to memorize. They are UAG, UAA, and UGA. Sometimes they're also known as nonsense codons because translation will stop when you encounter one of these three stop codons. And one of my teachers taught me how to memorize the stop codons and the start codons. So to remember the start codon, I kind of think of August because that's usually when school starts, when our semester starts in the fall. And for the stop codons, what my former teacher taught me was, um, if you want someone to stop, um, you can think, you are gross, you are annoying, you go away. Okay, that's not very nice, but it helped me remember the stop codons. Maybe it will help you guys too. So if I gave you this chart, I might have these blanked out, and I would ask you to fill them in and tell me what they mean. To fill them in, it would be pretty easy because you have the axes to tell you what letter goes where. And then you just have to memorize which one is the start, which amino acid, and that these three are the stop codons. All right, so earlier I said that genetic code is degenerate. And what that means is each amino acid is encoded by more than one type of codon. Interestingly, the genetic code is also universal, or I should say nearly universal. Almost all species use the same genetic code for protein synthesis, and this has huge implications in molecular biology and the type of techniques that we can perform in the lab. So uh, conservation of these codons means that what we can do is take some kind of mRNA from one species, like a horse, that's the example that our book gives us, and move that into a plant cell, and the plant cell could make the horse protein. And we do this all of the time in the lab where we have bacteria, for example, and we take their messenger RNA and put that into human or other animals to have the other animal translate that messenger RNA into some kind of functional protein. So this really provides evidence that all of the different species on Earth share some kind of common origin. And then this is just for fun. You don't have to know this at all, but I've seen these pop sockets. Um, that have the genetic code, and I thought that was kind of cool. You could get a pop socket for your phone with a genetic code on it. Well, it's cool to me. I don't know if you guys would ever go out and get something like that. So you're going to see that in this week's Canvas module on our website, I've inserted an item for you where I put this link into the module, and you get to choose any of these three genes, and you're going to transcribe and translate that gene. So please try this for practice. There's also a link directly to the site from the OpenStax textbook. Before you go to the next video, make sure you try this activity first. And that takes us to the end of our first video. In our second video, we're going to jump into the details of transcription. How exactly do we go from DNA to messenger RNA?